Welcome to another episode of React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by Waffles. Because what better way to start your day than a carb-loaded punch straight to your midsection? Episode 270, Diving into React Native 0.72 with Lorenzo Chandra and Ricardo Cipolletsky. So, Robin, any chance you have, like, four or five grand laying around for the new Apple glasses or whatever they're called? <laughs> Apple Vision Pro. I think I'm going to skip this version, but I'm pretty sure someone on our team around here is probably going to go buy some, and I'm very excited to see what they're like. Yeah, it was a, it was interesting to see it happen. They spent a lot of time on the, the video part of it and demoing it and the dev kit part, which was interesting. So I usually look out for the iOS versions because those are the ones that are like more fun to me. Yeah, the iOS updates were pretty cool. Of course, we're talking about WWDC, the keynote which I'm sure all of you listen to. Around here, it's practically required watching. We like stop what we're doing and huddle and listen to it. It's true, though. We all like we all get in a room and watch it. But Vision Pro, uh, lots of message updates, a triple guitar. I. <laughs> who knows who came up with that idea? Do our guests, who I'll introduce shortly, do any, either of you have any opinions of how that went? So, about the triple guitar, <laughs> I'm going to put on my team for that. Like, I, I'm really deep into post-production and stuff, and I, I think there was some CGI involved in that. Like, it was, it, it didn't feel as heavy as it should be. I don't know about that, but no, overall, I I, I, I watched it all, all, well, almost all. But yeah, I had a meeting, sadly, we don't have that uh, policy in here. I enjoyed the keynote overall. Of course, I'm an iOS engineer, so... My heart is on the Apple side for a bit, but there is one thing that didn't digest really that much because they claim to be the first one doing like the Vision Pro or doing revolutionize mm. the augmented reality space, which is, it's a lie. It's at least a couple <laughs> of years that Meta is doing that. So that's pretty classic Apple. Yeah. Uh, I've done that a couple of times. I feel like they're like, we're the first. No, definitely not Android the first. Well, and like who can forget, um, the original Google Glass. Yeah. What was that like 20 years ago now? Something like that. We all know how that went. <laughs> Android has had a bunch of stuff that iOS eventually comes out with. It's like revolutionary, but it's like uh, Samsung or Android has had that for 10 years. Has it been? Uh, but it was it was entertaining to say the least. I am excited about some of the message features and um, FaceTime voicemails are actually one of my favorite features from the release because yeah. we FaceTime grandparents a lot and <laughs> they don't pick up and it'd be fun to be able to leave messages. Well, thanks to you, Robin, I downloaded the beta. So probably yes, after this, if I'll you're a, if you're part of the it. Apple developer program, which all of you should be if you're React Native engineers, uh, you can download the beta release if you just go into your software update tab. Yeah, I just hope that it didn't break anything. Yeah. Like, <laughs> iOS 17 and Xcode 15, like every year, like the first day of beta, someone opens an issue in the React Native repo and just say, it doesn't work with this. Like, <laughs> You're oh, like it's of been course 24 it doesn't. hours. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a minute, please. <laughs> Xcode That's hasn't funny. finished downloading yet. Has it happened yet? Do you have any issues yet? I didn't want to check, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you don't want to know. <laughs> I downloaded that, but I haven't had the time to try it out today, but I will do so tomorrow. Cool. As you may have noticed, I'm not Jamin. Jim's on a plane currently returning from Render Atlanta. I'm Mazen. I live in Durham, North Carolina with my wife and baby boy. I'm a former pro soccer player and coach and a senior React Native engineer here at Infinite Red. I'm joined by my outstanding co-host Robin and our two very special guests who I'll introduce in a minute. Robin is a lead engineer here at Infinite Red. She's located west of Portland, Oregon with her husband and two kids and has specialized in React Native for the past five years. Lorenzo Chandra, who you probably know as Kelset, is a senior software engineer at Microsoft and has been a maintainer of React Native since 2018, version 57.4. That's a long wow. time. That, that's a long time. And he lives in London, UK. Our other guest, Ricardo Cipolleschi, is a software engineer at Meta with a primary focus on iOS. 
Prior to that, he was an iOS engineer at Bending Spoons, and he lives in London as well. We are super excited to have you guys on. I think this is our first time having um, people from the, the React Native release team to talk about a release before, and we're super excited. And hopefully we can keep this going because there's a lot of a lot of content that we want to cover and hopefully we can get through all of it here today. Yeah, we're 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 going to try not to read the change log line by line, but we want to hit the hit the exciting bullet points. <laughs> yeah. All of those 1000 lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course, this episode is sponsored by Infinite Red. Infinite Red is a premier React Native design and development agency fully located remote in the US and Canada. If you're looking for React Native expertise for your next React Native project, hit us up at infinite.red. Forward slash react native. Don't forget to mention that you heard about us through the React Native Radio podcast. I like the forward slash. I feel it made me feel like I was in like 1995, and they were they were reading out URLs like HTTP colon forward slash forward slash. Done that. <laughs> well, HTTPS. Oh yeah. Right? Well, they didn't have S back then, did they? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into our topic for today. Diving into React Native 0.72 with Lorenzo and Ricardo. Before we dive into the topic specifically. I'd like to hear from you guys. A lot of the listeners and developers out there probably have seen your avatars out there. You've closed their issues. I'm kidding. <laughs> or helped merge their PRs out there. Can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got to where you are now? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm super happy to be back here. I think the last time I was here, it was like a super long time ago. So it was probably. I think be it was back. probably before we... Uh took over it the podcast be. i'm guessing yeah yeah it's been so long but yeah uh, hi everyone uh, i'm lorenzo and yeah i'm super happy to be here with you all today uh to share a bit about myself um i started doing react native when i was in italy uh right after university i was working for a small consultancy and all of a sudden we had a client with a project that involved uh bought a full full stack backend but also a front-end mobile. And they said, how about you try and find something that works cross-platform? And I was about to go with Xamarin. Mm -hmm. And luckily mm -hmm. in the meeting where I presented my idea, uh, someone very senior from the company said, how about React Native? And I was like, I'd never heard of that. And <laughs> from that moment onward, that is basically being the thing that dragged me in more and more and more into itself. And I've been, yeah, growing ever since moving to London changing from startups into consultancy now at microsoft and now i'm basically my full-time role is pretty much doing whatever is needed for react native to be better so yeah it also involves being part of the release crew and helping making sure that the new releases are good and stable that's awesome awesome so about me i used to work in italy for a company called bending spoons when i did six years of only ios development nothing more than that and moving to London, working for Meta, I wanted to expand a little bit my knowledge as a software engineer. And I found in React, in the React Org and React Native specifically, like the best fit. Because as everyone knows, it's not just iOS, but there are plenty of other technology involved. And yeah, I really like the idea of working with different technology at the same time. I'm working with a team which is specifically heavily involved in the open source. And part of our responsibility is doing releases. Uh, it's a very fulfilling kind of task to, to release a new version of React Native and to interact with the community. So that's how I got here. That's awesome. Before we actually get into 72, I'd also like to hear just a sort of a TLDR about what goes into a release or a release cycle. You're you're constantly doing work on React Native, but where do you decide, like, okay, this is where we're going to draw the line and do a release? What sort of phases does it go through before we as developers get to install it? So that's a great question, to be honest. Uh, and the answer has not been the same f throughout all the years of being a releaser. We actually now are in a place where um, I'm honestly excited by how we do releases. And it all starts with the release crew. The release crew is composed of two people from the meta team and two people from the community. And these four people, once they get the baton from the previous release crew, that's when like everything kicks off for a new minor, uh, in this case, 72. So for example, in, uh, in this specific scenario, what happened is that me, Ricardo, Marek from Shopify and Luna, again from meta, we 
got the role, the responsibility, and now we are the people responsible for all the releases for all the miners that are part of the release support window, which means working on 72, but also working on 71, the current latest, and 70 and 69. Mm -hmm. uh, once the crew kind of gets in uh, formally in place, uh, that's when they get basically the driving wheel. So it's up to them to define a good point for the cut. That usually means communicating internally with Meta and defining, okay, do we have all the features that we want and that we need? Is the branch, is the main branch in shape ready for providing, uh, you know, a good commit for a branch cut? And then at that point, once we fully define, okay, it's going to happen on this day, at this point, that... Uh, so basically that means we get a green light from Meta. At that point, we create a branch and then we start the RC process. During the RC process, that's when uh, we try, to, with the help of the community, to figure out all the problems and all the things that weren't detected while the code was only on main. So we do these release candidates, basically, mm -hmm. and we ask the community, the library maintainers, to try them out. That's where like, we figure out and find all the main bugs. We address them. We do new RCs. And then once we feel confident that we're good to go, we do what is called the golden release candidate. Uh, in this case, for 72, we were hoping that 72 point, the, the RC3 was going to be the golden one. Uh, then, of course, as it always happens, when you actually say, okay, this is the golden one, a bunch more people try it out, <laughs> things break. <laughs> And then you need to do follow-ups. So, so it's for not example, really now, golden, it's like bronze. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, in retrospect. <laughs> but no, like, we, 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 are, we want to be optimistic, you know? Like, we're yes. like no, no, well, this you is have cute. to call it golden so that people will try it. <laughs> exactly, and get exactly, the, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but <laughs> let's not tell anyone about this. It's going to be our little secret. Uh, but no, uh, once, once we get to the point where we do the golden, people actually test it, things break, we fix those. At that point, we give a grace period of like, usually it's one or two weeks for like the proper latest RC to kind of sediment and like people to do some more testing and report if the problems that they have surfaced are fixed. And then that's when we say, okay, now uh, this RC, no one has been reporting new issues. Let's find the date that works for the release crew and let's aim to do 0 0.0 at the first available time. So in this scenario, our original like deadline when we said RC3 is the golden, uh, I think 72.0 was planned to be like the last week of May, like basically right after a chain react, then a few more issues bubbled up. So right now, uh, well, at the time of the podcast being out and everyone listening, it means that we finally reached that day. And if fingers crossed, yeah. everything goes well, this means that it's <laughs> around between the 15th and 20th of June. Uh, so that's pretty much what it goes into. So there are four people constantly working on them, getting all the feedback from the community, trying to figure out how to fix the problems, and then producing the new releases so that we can get this feedback loop constantly going to the point where we're like, okay, the signal is good. We can, we feel confident in getting to point zero. That's really interesting. Do the four of you on the release, like, crew, is this like your full-time job or are you doing this on top of what you normally do at Microsoft? It's, uh, I think we, like when we make people sign their souls into being part <laughs> of the release group, no, we, we ask them to account at least four hours a week okay. for doing release crew mm -hmm. work. It, it's actually a bit more than that usually uh, if something goes wrong or we need mm -hmm. to backport certain fixes to all the releases. But in general, it's not the only thing you do during your time in the release crew also because especially for us in the community our companies may not see as much value in like okay i'm mm -hmm. losing an engineer for mm -hmm. an entire two months uh, so it's usually like a balancing act and that's why we have four people like probably yeah. like for the longest time it was like me and mike Rabowski, so like even one or two people but with having four you can kind of like at least two people can always be around. So it's yeah. a balancing act, basically. But yeah, I think four hours a week on average, that's probably still a good estimate. And you said it, it like you rely a lot on people in the community and library maintainers testing these RCs to sort of progress the release and polish it. Do you have a direct channel to to these folks where like you can ask them to test certain things or give them a heads up like, this particular thing changed, can you test it? How do you ensure that it's been tested thoroughly enough? Another great question. Uh, 
it's it, it's an exercise of trust in a way. What we try to do is communicate as much like uh like to the general public as possible. So like in the GitHub release for the pre-release, we always say, please test it. Here's the link. Here's how you have to do it. This is where you report back. But also for example, um, in some of the open source projects that we as Microsoft own, we have CI that tests against nightlies and we also test against the RCs. So that's mm-hmm. the first like direct way of testing that at least the baseline works. And on top of that, especially for some key library maintainers, we have some direct communication channels where we say, hey, yeah. library maintainers, please test it. Yeah. And usually that helps a lot, especially towards the starting part of like the RC phase, because that's when library maintainers like are tro- are most likely going to hit some problems and we then need to fix or address. Right. So yeah, usually we try to get the library maintainers, especially especially for like big libraries like Reanimated. I'm saying like React Navigation, Reanimated, like the ones that m- most of us have installed. You really, yeah, you really want to make sure they're solid. Yeah, we we try to to get them to test early and then like to also test when we think it's good to go. And in this scenario specifically, like there were a couple of things that now the libraries need to fix on their end. Um, so yeah, that, that's work. It's like a constant back and forth to really try and make sure that at least like when a new release comes out, people can upgrade because the libraries are already caught up, at least the main ones. Yeah, I really like that because it, it's really closing the loop in on there having to be a lag. So let's say you release 72, then as a library maintainer, then I need to now come in, digest everything, test it, make up necessary updates, and then cut a new release. So not only is there the lag of the update, there's also the lag of your packages. So you guys working side by side mm-hmm. with them, I think is an amazing thing for the community in general. Right. And if you are a library maintainer on the community, I'm sure you know they could also give some feedback to, even if they're not part of this you know, group or whatnot, their feedback is also valuable because they might have a subset that you know you might not be targeting specifically in your testing, but they get to find out early and then kind of help prevent any issues down the line, especially. So I, I really, I really like that. Well, I mean, it's really mutually beneficial too, because like if React Navigation isn't it's like isn't working with seventy two, people aren't going to upgrade to seventy two until it is, and so the sooner exactly. you can get support from both sides, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just to be clear, that's also like why the first place where we look for feedback is the discussion because those are open and any library maintainer can you know submit their feedback and everything and also uh, this is a small like teaser it's not uh we are going to publish an rfc soonish over the next couple months Uh, basically we want to try to make the communication toward the library maintainers better and like also provide them similarly to what we have like the upgrade helper that kind of gives you you know, a diff mm-hmm. of like the changes you need to do in your app. We want to have something similar for library maintainers. Like we want to have some more guidelines and also like diffs for library mm-hmm. maintainers. But uh, it's still like in the works. But w- we are in the very, let's say, experimental phase of like trying to figure out how to do it. But over the next couple of months, an RFC should come out, which nice. will have a detail of like, okay, library maintainers, we're, we're going to try to make life easier for you all through these tools and automations. That's awesome. I mean, I know the, the upgrade helper completely like changed my upgrade experience personally. So. Oh yeah. Me too. Yeah. I'm sure whatever, whatever you come up with will be awesome. Let's actually talk about the meat of 72. It seems like the sort of headliners coming out of it are um, some metro improvements, including sim linking, which I know we and a lot of people have been asking for sim linking support in metro for a long time. Can you talk a bit about the metro updates that are coming through, what sim link support is, why it's a big deal, and then maybe we can touch on a couple of the other metro updates. Okay, yes. Um, so Metro Simlink was the number one issue in the Metro open source repository. So it's something that really requested uh, by the community. I got some notes from the developer experience team in Meta because it's not directly my area of expertise. So I hope I'm not going to say silly things. But basically, uh, to understand what Simlinks are, and why it's such an important thing, we need to talk a little bit about what Metro does. Uh, I'm sure that most of the audience know that already, but 
for the people that are approaching the framework for the first time. Metro is basically the thing that package all the JavaScript files in your bundle, in your app, React Native app, and provides those files to like the, the app itself. So is the thing that packages all the JavaScript files and allow the native side to interpret them and render your views and like run your JavaScript logic. To do that, before 72, Metro needed all the proper path, let's say, to the each actual file inside the, in the your application and eventual mm -hmm. your node modules inside your libraries. Uh, something that does not really work very well in some more advanced scenarios like monorepos or stuff where uh, node modules are not really like on the same structure, but they have these sim links, which is basically a folder which says that it contains a files, but the files is not really in that particular location on disk, but there is mm -hmm. actually a link to another location on your disk saying that actually the file is there. So Metro was not able... It's like a shortcut. Yeah, Metro was not able to follow this, this shortcut to the real path of the file. Uh, and like solving this issue allows for these more advanced kind of scenarios where the file is not really there, but you have a link to a file and Metro can now follow it. I've also some more low level details that the team share with me, but I thought why it was so difficult to pull it out in the first place. And we have to wait so much time, but I don't mm. know how much in the technical details we can go. So I know there's a really fantastic talk by Alex Hunt, which yeah. he gave at AppJS conf which we'll put we'll put we'll put in the show notes and that i think goes into a lot more detail about the metro changes yeah alex gave the, this talk there are not a lot of details specifically on sim links on the technical side on the talk but there is a lot of good content on other features we are going to talk about in a, in a few minutes um i know personally we ran into this issue oh gosh it was probably three three years ago now um, where we had a, a web and mobile monorepo and we wanted to sim link like shared, uh, shared code. And what we ended up doing was basically, um, keeping everything within the react native app and then the web app. So like sim linked into the react native app so that as far as Metro was concerned, they were all real files. Uh, and that was how we got around that. But like sim linking in Metro has been something that people have been talking about for a long time and it's really nice to see it finally land. There was a couple other Metro changes, including package exports, which I think is primarily um, a feature that package maintainers will care about. I didn't, I don't know a ton about package exports because I don't make packages, yeah. but. <laughs> so again, the team shares some notes with me so I can try to shed some light here. Um, basically, uh, as far as understood, before this change, not all the package available on NPM could be used inside uh, React Native because uh, they were not compatible um, with how React Native handled packages, basically. Uh, with this change, this change increased the compatibility of React Native with all these JavaScript packages, which were using those features that were not supported by Metro. Keep it simple. So now... Uh -huh. uh, we can use packages that were that, that were before were only working with Node or Webpack, for example, and now can work without changes also in React Native. Cool. One thing that the team highlighted, and I need to like stress a little bit here, is that all these features are kind of in a beta experimental stage. So it's really important that mm -hmm. everyone that is interested in using them try them out and report if something is not working, so that we can address them like address those issues and improve the experience for everyone. Definitely. I think that, yeah, I think that's um, going to be pretty clear in the announcement that they're beta features, but test them out, report back, and it's still very exciting to see them. So yeah, the TLDR with the Metro um, improvements is go watch Alex Hunt's talk. And uh, it, it seems like in general, there's a big focus on developer experience improvements. And I think that applies in some other areas as well. Mazen, uh, I don't know if you want to go into the the other developer experience improvements that were in the release. Yeah. Developer experience is something that I'm always, you know, stressing to our clients that, hey, this is something that React Native is going to bring a lot of developer experience to the table to help 
make your lives easier. And, you know, we leverage other things like TypeScript and ES Lint and all that kind of stuff just to make things very simple. Now, I will say the one thing on here that I kind of want to touch on probably first, even though it's potentially subtle, but now that you don't see that undefined is not a function, that red box, that very random and vague red box, you know, now it says X is not a function, you know, it's undefined and you get, you get pointed towards it. It's such a subtle change and it's so, it's so it's impactful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it's huge. It, yeah. Robin, you, you said it's so subtle, but at the same time, it's going to help all the developers out there debugging and kind of get to the solution quicker. Another one that I saw in here was the invalid style properties no longer shows a red box. That might just seem, you know, trivial, but that's kind of the then, opposite effect. It's like, yeah. it's, um, like not interfering with your your workflow so much for for errors that really don't like don't break the app mm -hmm. like it, it'll tell you but it's not like preventing you from continuing yeah so yeah so most of these are just kind of getting removing either removing stuff that's not relevant or like slowing you down and then giving you tools to kind of speed things up you know other things like filtering out bytecode that isn't relevant for hermes errors i feel like you know for the main developer up front, that really necessarily doesn't really matter. That's all under the hood related stuff. Uh, React Native CLI error output improvements. Hey, we could all, you know, help, use that help to be able to debug our issues that kind of come out there. It's like not, not showing you stuff that doesn't help you. And when you do need help showing you stuff that's more helpful. <laughs> and I know, Ricardo, you had, a, you had a point on the whole developer experience in general, right? Yeah. Referring again to the Alexand video and talk at AppJS, uh, Matt is doubling down a little bit on the developer experience for React Native. The team has grown last year. And yeah, we, we are very invested in trying to improve the debugging experience of React Native, especially from the web perspective, and try to make it easier to work with our framework. We use a lot also the input from the community and we are collaborate, collaborating with some partners uh, to try and improve like the old stack trace situation, for example. So yeah, uh, we really care about the, the developer experience, upgrade experience, and we, we are trying to make it better for everyone. And we do see that and we, we do feel that as developers, like there's a lot of stuff that's come a long way and it's just making our experience at the keyboard that much simpler. Yeah, and I mean, also from the perspective of like one of these partners being Microsoft, uh, like the developer experience is paramount for us. Like we really need to be able to, you know, have hundreds, if not thousands of engineers being able to use React Native and deliver quickly. So the developer experience is very important, especially because internally, sometimes, you know, we need to compare React Native to other technologies. And so having a good developer experience is very important. And we're happy also that most of these conversations, or at least a good portion of them, are happening in the open. There's a dedicated working group, like similarly to the new architecture one and some others, that is dedicated to the developer experience. It's under the React Native community org. So if you want to check out like some of the discussions that are happening between these partners, you can find the notes of the agenda of the meetings in there. Uh, there was, at Chain React, there was a talk by, um... I think it was Kadi uh, about building a five-star app. And this reminds me of that because it's like you can build all the cool features in the world. But if if a developer has a bad experience when they have an error, like <laughs> that's all that yeah. they're going to remember. So the, the more you can improve that, like re minimize that negative experience, that's going to be more impactful than like, cool, shiny new features, ultimately. Yeah. Lorenzo, you were joking about people opening an issue at the first day of a release. <laughs> this is another scenario where if complain. the developer <laughs> has a... Exactly. You're not going on there to give a positive review <laughs> most of the time for the restaurant, right? You're usually going on there to complain about hair in your food. Do you ever get issues where people are just like, I just opened this because I want to say how awesome you guys are? <laughs> no, I've seen, you know, like sometimes there is that like month month of maintainers where like maintainers are celebrated and i see like some of these yeah. smaller more open source center communities having all these screenshots of like good things are like uh, crying in the corner <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way this doesn't mean that now you need to 
come into the Ragnet issues and all, but like <laughs> we're trying to get the countdown. So it's okay. Don't, don't open issues like just work. to say thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe just we maybe just tweet like about it. it once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about another um, pretty significant um, part of the release, which is the mitigation for the Android text input ANRs, which stands for application not responding or application not responsive. Um, this seems like a pretty big deal, be partly because you guys are doing backported releases, which I don't... Have you guys ever done backported releases before? All the time. <laughs> so just like a quick, just a quick summary. There's an issue around multi-line text inputs on specifically Samsung devices with Grammarly enabled, I think. So it's a really specific situation, but... I mean, there's lots of Samsung users out there. And so it was actually impacting quite a lot of people. But how did this issue get discovered? How did you find out the root cause? And then how did you decide that you needed to backport to older releases? Yeah, I, I, I think that this uh, problem specifically has been like ever a true test of like all the processes and uh, all the work that we've done over the the last couple of years in like how to handle releases, how to handle problems from the community, because this was originally a problem reported from the community. We didn't pick it up at mm -hmm. Microsoft. We didn't pick it up at Meta. Uh, and to be even more specific, it was only on Samsung devices with Android 13, <laughs> with a very specific version of the Samsung <laughs> OS. It was like, how do you even realize that that's where it comes from? But like, it, no, I mean, of course you have Crusher porting that literally tells you it's yeah. this very specific <laughs> series of things. But like, it was so complicated to figure out even what was going on. And that's why like also, yes, yeah, 72 is going to be the first version to kind of have it out of the box for everything else. We had to add it as a patch release. The problem there was that because it was so specific and it uh, required basically to have a physical device with that, uh, until we had a proper like repro, like until someone uh, from the community opened the proper issue with an actual repro that was like properly reproducible, like you could could take that code, go into a Samsung device and try it out. It was very very hard to understand what was actually going wrong. But once we got that, uh, Meta was able to provide an engineer to kind of like work on that full time. It was also very hard to. Like properly fixed, we had to do two full rounds of patch releases. The first one wasn't good enough in a way. Mm. So it, it was very intense and took a very long time to fully address. Uh, so first off, a shout out to Nick Gerleman, which is like the engineer from Meta that did the work. And also the way we decided to do the patch uh, basically was a matter of like looking at the data. Uh, we have a website called rn version dot github dot io or something like that uh, we can put it in the show notes but basically on that you can see that the daily tracking of like all the downloads on npm yeah. and like how they're split between versions and with that tool which funny enough it was also made by the same guy nick gerleman <laughs> we were able to decide okay what's the what, what's the baseline what do we define as a version that we need to backport this to or what uh doesn't you know is not tall enough to to mm -hmm. open the ride i think that what we ended up doing especially for the first round was commit to uh, 68 because back then when we first decided the first round of patches it, it was still like around 10 or 15 percent even uh, now luckily the numbers are much more like 71 heavy like 71 has surpassed the 50 percent mark in terms of like market share yeah so mm -hmm. i don't think we would go out of the release window which again is 71 70 and 69 currently uh but in general like we we were trying to at least fix it for the majority of the developers i think we were aiming at 90 percent of the user base or something like that um so that's where like we try to use the data we're like okay these many versions we can do also because it became a practical problem so do we even have the ability to still test those older versions right. and ensure that that fix doesn't break more stuff than it actually addresses mm -hmm. yeah so it was a very hard balancing out of like okay how confident are we in doing this patch versus how many people will this affect but in the end i think that we are we were able also to you know to provide it to enough people that once their the full fix was out as it usually happens for issues that are fixed 
No one wrote a comment. You didn't hear like, anything. That's when you know. <laughs> exactly. That's when you know that something is fixed. Silence. When you post a comment saying, hey, we've done this release. Can you tell us if it's working? And no one No news is good news. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Was that the kind of thing that would bump you and your release crew over four hours a week to try and manage? Definitely. When those kind of things happen especially when they are of this like, magnitude. People jump in. Uh, the team in Meta is also like the team in mm -hmm. the React org team that takes care of working on React Native is also very responsive and very like willing to, to help. As Lorenzo was saying, Nick is not part of the release mm -hmm. crew, but it was like a key player in fixing this problem together also with Nicola uh, Corti which helped as well. Uh, they both like jump in in the problem, helping out uh, us that we don't have a huge Android experience in this case while they have. So that's a great thing. Uh, with very good vibe of the team internally. But yeah, definitely for them, it took a few days of work to, to manage to find a fix. And that uh, these are yeah. the events that increase the number of hours that are required uh, for our release. And nobody can really like, account for them yeah. when it starts this number of patches actually like put the average of like releases that we've done in 2023 at least as of last week like to one per week as average uh -huh. which is like crazy like we've done because so you many did releases like this four year. at the same time yeah because we had to do so many backwards <laughs> yeah uh, to so many different minors so yeah. yeah basically anytime there was a new fix we had to at least account for four releases yeah. and that means cherry picking testing releasing cherry picking testing releasing and that means also producing the change logs producing the github release notes so th there's a, a lot, not, not a lot, but there's always also a bit of overhead of like the communication part of it that uh, when you do so many, like kind of adds up. So yeah, definitely those weeks were a bit higher than the four hours. Well, we, we appreciate it for sure. I know we have a couple of our lar really large projects are still on 68, I think. Because upgrade. Why would you throw them under the bus? <laughs> I will not name any names and it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> it's just a very difficult version to get past because of new architecture additions. And so they're kind of like stuck on 68 for a while. Uh, so I'm sure they appreciate it. Project I just kicked off for on 71. So <laughs> and I'm going to do 72. I have a branch for 72 going. Nice. Cool. The next section I kind of want to talk about, well, the first part of it is the breaking changes part. And I think I want to bring a section of this to the, to the top first. Uh, and this has to do with the package renames. So, Essentially, we're turning React Native into a proper monorepo. <laughs> and, you know, if you weren't at Chain React, so you probably didn't hear Lorenzo's talk. It's on online now, and though. We'll put it in the show it notes. It is. So hopefully everyone's listened to it. I'm sure people would have listened to it before this. So I guess the, the main point for the listeners is if you, you know, check out the, the link that we're going to put in the show notes. If you're using any of these specific packages as a direct dependency, you have some breaking changes, so you kind of need to make some updates. Everything now lives under the react-native slash forward slash mm -hmm. packages. So it's all all housed there now. Like React so Native sure itself specifically. Like it used to yes. be like React Native itself was sort of at the top and then the adjacent packages were nest like nested underneath in the packages directory, which sounded like it got really complicated. Yeah. They were I think feel like they were scattered. Now everything's kind of being brought home and kind of organized better. So I guess for those who weren't fortunate to see your talk, Lorenzo, in person or um, haven't listened to the talk yet, can you give a summary on what these improvements are and like from your perspective, like why this was necessary to do? Absolutely. Um, and also, it's great to hear you try to remember my talk because you got so many <laughs> things right. I was like, yes. <laughs> and, it was a really um, good talk. It was. Thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. Uh, but yeah, okay. So let's um, make it easy and understandable for people. So when you went into GitHub and opened the React Native repository, you would basically see the shape of a standard library. So you would see all the different files, all the different folders. And then there was also a packages folder. And that packages folder was a monorepo. So at the same time, the repository was the node module of React Native and a monorepo. And that is very, very 
non-standard and you should not try this at home. So please don't do it. <laughs> it will just create a lot of pain for you. Uh, this also means that doing releases, for example, meant that whenever we were cutting a branch, we would actually kind of like configuration-wide yeet out the monorepo side so that only the node module part, uh, the, the actual React Native stuff would end up in the node module. Um, so as you can imagine, this wasn't ideal. Um, that also meant that to do the releases for the sub packages, it was very convoluted and it was usually manual only. And so only someone from Meta had the right level of authorization to do a new release for those packages. But some of those packages were also like on versions that were completely random. Like I think one of the packages was on 3.2.1. Is like, <laughs> how do you even know which version of React Native can use that uh -huh. package? It's like yeah. pure madness. So what we did last year, like almost, it's been over a year now, we sat down and we were like, okay, this needs to change. We worked on an RFC. We created a, a graph where we were showing the entire mapping of like, okay, there's React Native and these are all the packages. These are all the versions. These are all the names. We we're like, okay, this needs to change and let's put it in a proper monorepo. So let's put everything. So also the React Native stuff under the packages folder and let's rename everything to be consistent and let's reversion everything so that everything is on the same versioning scheme as React Native itself. So now if you're using React Native 72 and you're using React Native Gradle plugin, that version of React Native Gradle plugin will follow Semver, so it will be 072 something. So you know which version matches which version of React Native. Yeah. To be clear though, we haven't ported back in any packages, like we've only reshuffled and cleaned up the room of what was already there. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add and call out a couple of things. Like um, that, mo this monorepo huge effort was started by Lorenzo, which drafted the initial RFC. There was a really cool graph involved, which we will link in yeah. the show notes because it is epic. <laughs> it was kickstarted by the community actually uh, during the React Native EU last year in uh, Rocklove. I hope I pronounced that correctly because the name I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> and like they started working on like moving the moving the packages from like giving the right names and refactoring the package.json file. And then one of my colleagues, Ruslan, drove it to conclusion uh, in, by the end of last year. So it was a huge community effort, uh, which had to end up in our field at Meta because of internal stuff, which are using React Native. So we had to make sure that everything was working, but like you just shout out to everyone involved because it was a huge effort and makes the life of everyone easier. Yeah, totally. And uh, also to bring it back to where we want to be like, it took so long, especially because there was so much work involved and without Meta, this wasn't going to be doable. Like we really yeah. needed Meta to buy into the idea and see the value in that. And 72 is going to be the first version post this change. So that's why, like uh, we were saying earlier, the breaking changes are going to be like mostly just renaming of packages, but it's very unlikely that you're using them directly. So just keep an eye on upgrade helper. You should see all the changes that you need to do unless you're doing something particularly complicated, but in which case you're an advanced user, so you know how to deal with these things. Yes, we're unfortunately running short on time, so I'll I'll try and wrap things up, but I want to hit the rest of the breaking changes really quick because we usually like to give people a heads up. Minimum node version is now 16. The used version is 18, but the minimum version is 16, so if you're below that, you need to upgrade. Get item layout on flat list now has better typing. The arguments have better typing. So that might be a breaking change. And then a bunch of components were removed, like slider, date picker, iOS, progress view, iOS, which are are now being shifted to community libraries, where like the support is being shifted to community libraries that most people are, are probably already using. I, I just wanted to note that I think it's a huge indicator of how strong the community support and infrastructure has become. Um, that like things can be removed from React Native Core because there's a community supported option that is so widespread and well maintained that like there doesn't need to be a core version anymore, uh, and that could be removed. Um, I'm really proud of of how solid the community is, especially in terms of libraries. Yeah, 
it's looking really good. That's um, I think that hits everything. Unless if there's anything that we miss that you guys want to touch on, speak now. Forever hold your peace. <laughs> well, very quickly, just to yeah, like kind of like plus one, very just what you were just saying about the community. Uh, like this release is over like one thousand commits. Like it's one thousand one hundred, mm-hmm. which I think is one of the biggest that we've done in the recent memory. And it's also possible because of so many people from the community submitting PRs. Uh, so I just wanted to close it off with a shout out to like all the people that submit PR because even if it may take some time to get them in, like we're improving the flows. So hopefully they get uh, faster in and like, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, on top of that, um, as uh, I said at Chain React uh, during my talk, so a little bit of shameful self-promotion here not uh, shameful at you all. can find not at all you can find that on youtube on the, on the infinite thread channel we actually need the community to report all the use cases that we don't have internally at meta or even at microsoft because like there are so many ways to use react native we don't we can't cover it all ourselves so we really need your contribution to make the framework better for everyone and yeah there are many ways in which you can help out there. In my talk, I explained some of those, but we are opening some other umbrella issues. Like this morning, one of my colleagues opened an umbrella issue to convert part of the code base from Java to Kotlin. Mm-hmm. So if you're an, an Android engineer and you want to... I was just going to say, like just this morning, like we we had a thread in our Slack. Someone posted the tweet and we had three, four people saying, oh, I'm going to go grab one. Like I really want to learn more about... Yeah. Um, like Java and Kotlin syntax, and it's a really great opportunity to to make a contribution. So I love I love seeing that. I love seeing people start to get more confident um, about sort of diving into something that was previously maybe sort of intimidating and scary, um, and now it's getting to be less so. Especially like your talk was really fantastic, and thank you. One of our developers, Frank, actually said he's like I listened to Ricardo's talk, and now I'm like already working on like contributing. Uh, so yeah. yeah, really great to see. It really helped like inspire people that were there to want to help out, which is, which is great. Cause it was kind of bringing all this together about version 72. There were 66 contributors and over 1100 commits. Like you said, Lorenzo, that that's a lot. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into every release, but at the end of the day, you know, we said these issues aren't open, but thank you and the team for all the effort that you put into every release. Cause it's, it helps us out a lot. And yes, it's never a shameless plug when you mention your talk, Ricardo. So See, no, it's shameless. Out. It's definitely not shameful. No. We encourage it. Yes. I, <laughs> we'll I encourage it. everyone to listen to Ricardo's talk because... We'll put both talks from Chain React in the show notes. Yeah. And that talk is very helpful if you feel inspired and want to help out because there's so much more out there that I'm sure you guys would want to cover. And the help of everyone will definitely help us close that loop quicker. Well, if you'd like to nerd out more about React Native, check out Jamin's Twitch stream at rn.live, uh, which I think he's planning on rebooting soon. He's so been taking we'll an extended soon. break. It's okay. He's tired. <laughs> you can also join our Slack community at community.infinite.red. There's, we have almost 2,000 React Native developers in there. Also, check out the Twitter community, rntwitter.infinite.red. If you'd like to reach out to either one of us, I'm at Maz and Chami. Robin's at Robin underscore Hines. Lorenzo's at Kelset. Ricardo is at Cipoleski R. And you can find React Native Radio at React Native RDIO. Thanks to our guests, Ricardo and Lorenzo. Thank you for joining us. This was nice to get to chat, chat with you guys. And hopefully we can have you on more often. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It was great. As always, thanks to our producer and editor, Todd Worth, our assistant editor and episode release coordinator, Judd Bartowski, our designer, Justin Husky, and our guest coordinator, Derek Greenberg. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check us out at infinite.red forward slash React Native. Special thanks to all of you listening today. Make sure to subscribe. We are React Native Radio. Robin, do you have a mom joke to close us off? Uh, I do. So this is courtesy of Carlin. He's one of our our dad and mom joke captains over here at Infinite Red. But (laughs) dogs can't operate MRI machines. I don't know if you knew that. But cats can. (laughs) Thank you, everybody. And upgrade your React Native apps. <laughs> Listen to Lorenzo. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>